Hello, can we get started? Can I have your attention and we bring this meeting to order? Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all, depending on wherever you are. Uh, welcome to this key important workshop uh, on advocating for universal health coverage uh, for Eastern and Southern Africa. So welcome everyone uh, for this call. This is very good for us and we really appreciate uh, your commitment and your time to be part of this key uh, important uh, workshop. So um, just go basically going to take you through introductions and welcome. And uh, before we start, I just want to uh, request uh, Kathy, my colleague, to uh, introduce herself and then we can get started. Thanks, Yvonne. Hi, everyone. My name is Karthi Manikrot, and I am the Communications Officer for the Civil Society Engagement Mechanism for UHC 2030. We are the civil society constituent of UHC 2030, which is the global multi-stakeholder platform to strengthen health systems and achieve universal health coverage. So you'll be hearing more about CSAM's work and UHC 2030's work today. And we are so excited to be hosting this workshop here in East and Southern Africa with the partnership of Ianaso and our wonderful colleagues listed here. Thank you so much, Kathy. And uh, my name is Yvonne Catherine Kahimbura. I work with IANASO. Uh, IANASO in full is um, Eastern Africa National Networks of AIDS and Health Service Organization. We are based in Arusha in Tanzania. IANASO also uh, hosts the Global Fund uh, Community Rights and Gender Anglophone Africa Communication and Coordination Platform. So welcome all uh, for this key workshop, uh, workshop. And I just want to take you through the housekeeping uh, before we begin this workshop. So note that this session will be recorded and we share with you the recordings later. Please keep muted unless it is your time to speak uh, so that we can be able to hear from our speakers. Um, introduce yourself in the chat box. You can um, indicate your name, affiliation, organization, the country you're coming from, uh, key areas of work, as well as your email address. And we also encourage you to add any question about the presentation uh, to the chat box at any time during the uh, workshop presentation and proceedings. Uh, please also share all relevant information that would be would attribute to this uh, workshop on universal health coverage and everyone's input is equally valued. So just to kick start, um, there is this link which Kathy will be sharing with us um, and the code in the chat box. This link will help us to enter the country where you currently are. Um, there will be a few questions that will be linked to this link. Please answer the question. Uh, an example is what do you understand by universal health coverage? What does it mean to you? So throughout this workshop, uh, we'll be able to have uh, some questions that's food for thought to be able to understand if you uh, really have uh, more insights about universal health coverage. So feel free to share your comments and questions in the chat box throughout this event. So Kathy will be sharing with you this link. Uh, please go into this link and be able to, um, to answer some of the few questions on universal health coverage. Thanks, Yvonne. The link is currently in the chat box shared by Sam. Uh, this is just to you know, get everyone, let everyone uh, get to know each other better. Uh, please open it and let us know where you're from. We see a lot of Kenya. It's getting bigger as more people answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's keep it for a couple more minutes. Let's do a few more answers. Um, if you can't find the link, you can go straight to menti.com and type in this code. We have Democratic Republic of Congo, Rwanda, Ghana, Tanzania, Canada, Malawi and Mauritius. Mm -hmm.
Spain, Ghana. One more minute, maybe we can get in a couple more answers. Yeah, I'm seeing Tanzania. Zimbabwe. Spain. And just wanted to note now that we have colleagues from uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo and others that we will be having workshops uh, in French, Spanish, uh, and hopefully Portuguese in the coming months focused on other regions. So please stay tuned for more information. Glad you could be with us today. Nigeria. Oh, this is a good mix but lots of Kenyan representation. Yeah. Should I move to the next question? Yeah. Please answer this. What does universal health coverage mean to you? Um, you know, this can be a very long answer, but try to answer it in one or two words. What does universal health coverage mean to you? Healthcare for all, equal health access. No idea. That's actually a good place to start because we will be talking a lot about this in the workshop today. So um, that is a great place to start. Health for all. All is a word that is coming up a lot in these messages, uh, which is great. Affordable healthcare. Reduced out of pocket costs. Inclusive, that's a great word. Free of charge, affordable. Equity, equitable access. Everyone is covered. Sustainable. Health within reach, age friendly. Community. Health at grassroots. Non discriminative. Unity. Equality in health. Minimal cost, maximum quality. That's a great one. Primary health care. Proper care. Okay, I think we'll pause it here and we will come back to this question. Um, but you know, we have some great themes here. Uh, the idea of equality and equity uh, for all the idea of uh, financing and making sure it's affordable and the uh, focus on quality and primary health care. So we did cover all three dimensions and um, we will talk about this in more detail. So thank you so much for participating in this. And as Yvonne mentioned, uh, please keep these questions in mind as we go through this workshop and uh, feel free to share your comments in the chat box, add your questions there as well. And um, during the discussions, we can come back to them. Thank you. Uh, Sorry, Yvonne, you're on mute.
Please, I request you to kindly mute your microphone if you're not talking. Thank you so much. So allow me to continue. Let me share my screen again. Okay. Um, Kathy, can you confirm? Yeah. We can see it. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. So thank you so much for that. Um, that's a brainstorming question. So let's start. Let's continue. Uh, the next uh, slide. Yes. Yeah, so just to give a little bit background uh, of uh, this workshop. I just want us to remind ourselves of the COVID-19 pandemic that has almost reached everyone. And we have come to realize that uh, health uh, is for all, leaving no one behind. So the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact around the world have made it abundantly clearly that achieving health for all should all be a priority for all stakeholders. And increasing access to comprehensive and quality health service through universal health coverage is a very key component for reaching health for all, uh, complementing important efforts to improve the social, economic, environment, and political determinants of health. I know Kathy has already given a little bit background of um, civil society engagement mechanism has developed a health for all advocacy toolkit and we'll be looking at that toolkit today to strengthen the capacity inspire action and mobilize civil society in support of the global movement uh, for universal health coverage so uh, just to take you through the objectives of this workshop uh, one is to support communities of advocates in the region from across sectors and spaces who are mobilized to engage on, on universal health coverage related issues by sharing information on the landscape of the USC in Eastern and Southern Africa, introducing a new resource for advocates interested in kickstarting universal health advocacy, health for all advocacy toolkit, and we'll be looking at that too. Uh, creating regional communication channels with participants who would like to remain engaged and also advocating for universal health coverage. And lastly, not least, is to support regional mobilization of community and civil society for the upcoming So these are our main objectives for this workshop. And um, looking at the expected outcomes, what do we expect from this workshop? One is to um, ensure that stakeholders, communities are mobilized coming together to advocate for UHC, understand how the Health for All Advocacy Toolkit can be used in their advocacy efforts and inspired to share it with partners and in their networks. Secondly, is a community of practice of advocates from across sectors and spaces are mobilized to engage on UHC related issues uh, at global, regional, and country level, uh, sharing experiences, challenges, and also best practices on how this we can advocate for universal health coverage across the region and the globe. Lastly is civil society stakeholders, partners join hands with civil society engagement mechanism to UHC day efforts in 2021, as uh, Kathy will be taking us through that at the end of the session. So this is how the agenda is going to look like. Um, this is how the program is going to look like, our introduction, which uh, we are taking you through. After that, we'll have a session on introducing the Health for All Advocacy uh, Toolkit, which is the main, main um, session for this uh, workshop. And then after that, we'll look at the UHC in Eastern Southern Africa, uh, looking at the advocacy landscape, looking at the progress made so far, as long as well as the challenges we have on Esmas Mlewa, I take us through that presentation. After that, we'll have a question 
We have discussion, we have a Q&A session, and please feel free to drop in your question in the chat box and also feel free to uh, unmute your microphone and ask questions. We'll have a break after that, and then we'll have our breakout rooms where we'll be exploring an advocacy toolkit PowerPoint, and we'll have our facilitators, as you can see on this, uh, to take us through the uh, breakout room uh, discussions. After that, we'll come back on BIN again, and then we'll have a short brief um, on UHC Day uh, campaign, and Kathy will take us through that. And then we'll have closing and next steps. I hope we keep time and be able to um, achieve all the sessions that we have planned to do for this workshop. So without taking any of your time, uh, let me hand over to Kathy to welcome our next speaker. Thank you so much, and um, I wish you fruitful deliberations. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Uh, I am pleased to welcome Ma uh, Maxwell Antwi as our next speaker. Maxwell is a CSEM advisory group member, as well as the country director at Farm Access Foundation. Maxwell is a member of the WHO roster of experts on digital health. Before joining Farm Access Group, he has worked over a decade in senior capacities within and outside the Ghana Health Service as a specialist obstetrician, gynecologist, healthcare manager, and a public health professional. The focus of Maxwell's current work is on aligning civil society voices and stakeholders for digital health innovations, health legislation, and implementation of digital health interventions. Today, we are pleased to have Maxwell here to present the Health for All Advocacy Toolkit. Thank you so much, Maxwell, and welcome. Well, thank you, Kathy, and uh, thank you, Yvonne. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, colleagues. Uh, so on behalf of the CSEM Advisory Group, I'm really happy to join this exciting session where we will we'll take a brief tour through the Health for All Advocacy Kit. And I hope that you'll be able to stay through to the end. Uh, uh, really, as CSEM advisory group, we really place a lot of emphasis on getting this advocacy toolkit really um, out there and, and being used by all of us as civil society. So please join us. Uh, please post your questions in the chat box as has been indicated, and then the team will be will be responding to that. Next slide, please. So. Basically, let me just give an overview of what we will do today. So we'll try and provide an overview of the advocacy toolkit, uh, which was developed by the Civil Society Engagement Mechanism for UHC 2030. We refer to it as, as CSCM. Um, and then we'll take some deep dives into part one and part two of the toolkit, which mainly will be focusing on some introductory information but also how the advocacy space for UAC looks like. Uh, and then we will discuss some advocacy resources. Some of them you know, for you might be new, some of them might also not be, not be new, uh, but more importantly, how that those resources could be integrated into your UAC work. Um, and the last bit we will focus on a very innovative resource library for toolkits, um, which will be very useful for your engagement work uh, in the advocacy space that you work in. Kathy, next slide, please. So really, if you look at UHC, and specifically also for the Sustainable Development Goal 3, um, we all agree that UHC is critical. Um, but one of the key elements that the world is waking up to is that actually it looks like the Sustainable Development Goal 3 is becoming the rallying point for all other SDGs. And this is really you know, striking it. So, so if, for example, you take quality of healthcare, um, it impacts on individuals, on families, on communities and countries. It impacts on agriculture, on education, on gross domestic products. It impacts on gender, you know, quality of healthcare impacts on inclusiveness. Um, and really health is wealth. So, so really, the world is waking up to the realization that the SDG3, and more specifically, the UHC, is becoming a foundation and cross-cutting linkage for many of the other uh, SDGs. And therefore, focusing on realizing SDG3, and therefore, UHC is really key 
uh, in realizing the other SDGs uh, as well. Next slide, Cathy. So really, if you look at our global stage now, you would realize that there's a huge momentum for UHC. You know, admittedly, almost every forum that you attend, you know, some words are mentioned around a UAC. There's, I think this has also been reinforced by the recent pandemic that we are all going through. Uh, but if you deep dive, you realize that, you know, that the information and the knowledge about UAC is quite, is not as deep as we would expect. You know, so big changes are expected, uh, but in order to do that, we need to keep UHC as the number one priority on the political agenda. And we need to keep mobilizing political will uh, to be able to realize the gains that UHC promises. And to do that, colleagues, we, we need stakeholders beyond health. You know, so we need, we need to mobilize through advocacy work, uh, communication experts, sociologists, you know, road and civil engineers, some recent data is showing that you know, trauma is, is, the, is the leading cause of death in, in the West African sub-region among adults. So you know, we need to really mobilize you know, city planners, security agencies, ministries of finance, you know, agricultural experts. So we really need to mobilize a huge political momentum for UHC beyond the health focus stakeholders that we, we, we are used to. And, and the quote that you see on the screen was made by an anthropologist uh, who really is reminding us that you know, the power is in people. So in order to get political agenda right and prioritize for UHC, we really need to mobilize people uh, and mobilizing people should cut across and should go beyond, beyond health in order that we may realize the, the gains of, of, of UHC. Uh, Kathy, if you move to the next slide, you, you realize that, and really, this is really the real emphasis for the tool. So, so please, the Health for All Advocacy Toolkit is a resource. So see it as a resource. Uh, it's a resource for networks. It's a resource for organizations. It's a resource for communities. It's a resource for advocates. It's a resource for civil society. Uh, some of the elements in there might not be totally new to some of us, uh, but some will be new, but really the focus is how you can compare the components in there with your current existing advocacy plans and see how that can be augmented, you know, to support the global movement for UAC. So the toolkit really is a resource. Um, it introduces some primary UAC concepts. So we will go through some of them through uh, this discussion, but also in the breakout section, you have the opportunity to also discuss some of them. Um, but it also describes the role that civil society can play, uh, not only at the national level, but also at the community and the local level, but also critically how civil society can play in the global health governance space. Um, so really the toolkit is, is really a resource uh, that can be used um, across countries and across communities in order to beef up and really mount a good momentum for, 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 for UAC advocacy. Uh, Kathy, if you move to the next slide, you know, it really, we looking at how the toolkit was developed and why, why it was developed. So about two years ago, um, there was a United Nations high level meeting on UHC. Uh, and this toolkit, toolkit emerged uh, in the lead up to that high level uh, meeting. It was really one of the landmark moments for global advocacy for, for UHC because it helped to prepare stakeholders in the UHC movement uh, under one umbrella called the UHC 2030 platform uh, where stakeholders came together to develop, if you like, what we will call key advocacy acts. Um, really focusing on what they wanted member states to commit to and achieve. Um, so if you walk to your local government uh, ministry, what could you hold your governments accountable for? Um, so, so the civil society engagement mechanism, which is actually the civil society constituent of the UAC uh, platform, hosted those advocacy sessions. 
uh, with the civil society communities, mainly at the country level, to identify what are the UAC gaps and how could we co-create messages uh, to fill those gaps. Um, and so also so that we as civil society will know what to ask our governments for, based on the commitment that they have made. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Many civil society to say, please, can you, I don't take instructions for me. Ask for more knowledge oh, and more information about UHC. And that was really cross-cutting there. So there was an ask for more knowledge and information around UHC. Um, and also the global ecosystem around UHC uh, was, re was realized that you know, more information and, and more knowledge uh, need to be galvanized around uh, UHC, which can be shared in a structured way with civil society and community representatives that will catalyze their advocacy work. So, so based on those uh, engagements and meetings, a survey was also conducted amongst the UHC um, 2030 uh, platform members. And, and all of that fed into developing uh, this toolkit. So the toolkit in summary really was really need-based and need-driven. And it was created based on the needs and was also refined through the uh, expectations of, of civil society and community representatives. So in summary, you know, see it as a one-stop shop for key information uh, and tools uh, for, for UHC. Uh, so if you move to the next slide, really it's we, the first part and the tool is, is in three parts. The, the kit is in three parts. The first part really focuses on a basic introduction to UAC. You know, how does UAC work? And why do we actually need the UHC? Uh, but also explain some key concepts uh, around UHC. Who are the main actors in UHC? What are the milestones to date around, around UHC? It, it also presents some resources and publications uh, and some glossary terms, key facts and examples that you can, we can all use for uh, advocacy work. Next slide, please. So really, if you deep dive a bit into part one, um, and I like the, the post that we did before this session where we're asking ourselves, you know, what's your understanding of UHC? You know, so one important step for all of us is to have a shared understanding of the goal of UHC. You know, UHC can mean different things to different stakeholders. And sometimes it can be seen as a complex term. Um, and when it's too complicated, then it limits others from being fully engaged on it. Uh, but really the simple definition of UHC is what you see on the screen. And so some, some key elements stand out is the aspiration that all people can obtain the health services they need. Uh, importantly, of good quality, but also important is the fact that they should not be suffering uh, financial hardship because they are assessing healthcare services. And if you really look at this you know, definition of UHC, it's not complicated, it's simple to understand. The three main elements stand out. One of the key elements that you see in there is about all people. So all people means that it's really talking about equity, you know, meaning healthcare must be equitable. Uh, one of the, the second component you see in there is about obtaining services they need, which is really talking about access to healthcare. And the last component you see in there is really about financial hardship. We really are focusing on financial risk protection. So those are the three key elements you know, if you ask to talk about UHC, these are the three key elements that should come out, equity, access, and, 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 and affordability. Of course, every country would have to, within their own context, define um, uh, UHC in line with their own uh, UHC roadmap. But in all of these, these three key elements uh, um, do stand out. Once we have these ground rules on the values we all espouse around UHC, around these three teams, then it's easier to mobilize people around for advocacy. And that really, um, health really lifts people out of poverty if we all mobilize ourselves uh, around it. You know, one of the themes that is really coming out around UHC and the values of UHC is really that it helps to what we call horizontalize vertical programs. You know, so the elements that we mentioned, so access, 
equity and financial risk protection or affordability would you know, it cuts across all vertical programs. So whether it's HIV, whether it's TB or malaria or MCDs or, or, or any other disease group, you know, the issues around equity, access and financial risk protection or, or, or avoiding financial hardship is really cross-cutting. And that is what really are the key values uh, that UAC uh, espouses. So the next slide, if you look into the two, you, you will also find uh, what, what we call an overview of UHC, uh, where we are so far, and the landscape and the milestones. We'll encourage you to just go through it and, and make yourself uh, conversant uh, with it. The next slide really, so, so, so what I've spoken about is actually part one of the tool. The part two of the tool is really about why is it important for civil society um, and why is this tool important for global health advocacy? And the critical role that civil society and communities can play. You know, so the first part was really about information uh, and sharing and knowledge sharing. The second part is really about asking ourselves why and how we can get it done. Um, really focusing on how civil society, as civil society players, we can get involved in UH design and implementation. So it really provides us with key messages that we can use um, as key advocacy messages and, and how we can play a very indispensable role. Uh, most of the time we focus on one side or the other, uh, but this tool encourages us to focus on the end to end, which is really about UHC design, planning, implementation, and monitoring for results as per the commitments that have been made by uh, the stakeholders around, around UH. So just really where the second part uh, really focuses on, and that's a very useful tool for, for advocacy plans. Kathy, if you move to the, 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 so really the key messages around UHC, and I did emphasize that when you're talking about the definitions around UHC, three key components stand out, equity, access, financial risk protection. In terms of our advocacy key messages, there are some key components that we, we should emphasize or we could emphasize. And that's because there are many policies and there are many problems and many policy problems that, and solutions that we can talk about. And if we don't have a very focused approach, we may not get the expected results. Uh, one of the key messages that we are encouraged to include in our advocacy is really about equity, really about equity, equity through you know, how national health plans are developed and implemented that leave no one behind and actually prioritize the most vulnerable populations first. So a key message around equity um, is encouraging that, you know, it should be part of our uh, advocacy uh, focus so that, you know, equity is not left as an afterthought, uh, but really is one of the main areas that our advocacy focuses on. The second component, really is about increasing financial uh, uh, financing for health. So really public financing for health and how we can work together with, the, with using public resources, uh, complementing private resources uh, to work towards the eventual elimination of user fees and out of pocket. And you see that this really addresses the third component of the definition of UAC, which is really about financial risk protection uh, or avoiding uh, uh, financial hardships. So, I mean, depending on which context we find ourselves, some of us call it user fees, some of us call it out-of-pocket payments. But really the second component of our advocacy measures should focus on how we can deal with uh, the issue of uh, financial risk uh, protection and elimination of user fees. The third component really is about governance. How can we make governance systems for health transparent and accountable to the communities and to civil society. And the fourth component um, really, is really about a human resource for health. Well, how can we, I think the, the COVID pandemic has really brought out to the fore the importance of investing in, in the health workforce. So in terms of key messages for advocacy, so four key areas that the, the toolkit empowers us to focus on uh, in order to get the needed uh, resource. Kathy, if you move to the next slide, the, it really paints the toolkit also in the second part, uh, paints the 
more like a stage-by-stage -stage approach that we can adopt as civil society in terms of what important roles we can play at all stages. So uh, in terms of advocacy around legislation, policy and priority setting and budgeting, um, you know, at the community level, mobilizing communities and, and, and supporting monitoring of, of UHC design programs uh, in line with the commitments that have been made. So really the two kits provides us with the, uh, the information and, and the tools to be able to go through uh, this. And you'll find examples uh, in that. So one example is uh, citizen-based movement in Thailand that ensured key provisions on accountability and the voice were included uh, in, the, in Th Thailand's National Health Security Act of 2002. Um, I saw a colleague um, indicating that he's from DR Congo. So the participatory budgeting project in Democratic Republic of Congo, which has enabled rural and urban citizens to participate in budget process. You find some of these examples in the toolkit, which really then contextualize all the discussions that uh, you have in part one. Part three, as I round up, uh, part three really lays out you know, steps that we can take in creating and implementing an advocacy plan. So really, if you look at you know, many of us, we're indicating which countries we are, we are calling in from or calling in from. You know, so really looking at where our, your country is on the road to UHC, um, but also identifying what are the key challenges and bottlenecks in the space that you, you, we operate in within the country, how we can map advocacy targets uh, and how we can map stakeholders that we can collaborate with. Um, but also how we can develop specific advocacy acts um, and incorporate some of the key messages that I've already spoken about, you know, in our advocacy work. But also importantly, we have a budget template in there that, you know, can use to explore the resources required for monitoring and evaluation. Um, so it really, the part three lays out steps in how we as uh, stakeholders uh, and advocacy giants, you can create an advocacy plan and implement them in a way that really helps all of us to realize the gains we expect from, from uh, um, UHC. So last but not the least, um, you, we have some key resources, just to mention the, the last part of the toolkit. Um, you have a resource library, which is very interesting. I will encourage all of us to you know, explore the resource library. It presents other complementary toolkits uh, and, and some additional materials that we can use for advocacy campaign. Um, so an example, what you find there is a data portal, for example, which can be found at the uh, uhc2030.org, uh, which can then be used to explore how your country is doing on the various commitments that uh, our governments have made uh, towards UHC. There's also the health budget toolkit which was actually released this year. So please have a look at it, um, which we can really use to design trainings around how we can analyze health budgets and conduct advocacy around health budgets. So really, you know, giving us the resources that we can use to really analyze health budgets for insights and how you know, we can position ourselves well in advocating around health budgets. The, the last, component that I will share with all of us, it really is just some, some ideas on how, on top of what I said, how you can use the kit. So, so please use it as a learning tool. Use it as a learning tool. Uh, it does not capture all the potential ways to advocate for you. But it's really a good, a good spring ball. Please also keep in mind that it's a live resource. It's a live resource. A new information will be added to the online version. Uh, with time as they become available. So um, use the kit, uh, but please always check on the online version for the newest uh, uh, revision. And so, so share your feedback and share your comments with us. Very soon we will be opening a discussion forum on the CSEM website. Um, and, and please feel free to join us uh, on, on those discussion forums. So please use this as a learning to um, secondly, also, please use this to start conversation and collaborate with others, you know, with new and old partners. Um, so when we were joining this workshop, we had a question around on the registration form, 
asking whether you would want to um, engage uh, with other civil society organization. There are many uh, of us online now, so please be very interactive, engage. But one of the two, one of the values of this tool is that it also helps you to be able to engage with uh, other civil society groups uh, and community groups uh, who are all, uh, you know, looking at how we can make UHC uh, realize its uh, promised value. I think the last, the last idea that I would want to share with us is that, you know, please share this toolkit. Uh, you may already be familiar with some of the elements, uh, but, you know, if you really go down there, you realize that many of those of us who are engaging on UHC do not have in-depth knowledge and information around UHC. So please share it widely in your network. Uh, consider organizing deep dives for staff events, you know, hosting community advocates. You can print, you can print a PDF version, but as I said, you know, before you print, please check online for the most recent uh, edition and please feel free to spread the news around UHC and how we can all share uh, in the roadmap to achieve UHC. The presentation uh, that we'll have today will all be available for you, which you can also use for your training uh, within your own network. So in summary, we are presenting you know, an introduction to the uh, Health for All Advocacy Toolkit. Please see it as a resource that you can use to augment what you're doing. Uh, and please feel free to share it widely, give the feedback that is required and use it as a collaborative tool. Um, over to you, Kathy, then. Thank you so much, Mayo. Uh, sorry, thank you so much, Maxwell. Uh, that was a very uh, thorough presentation of the toolkit. And as Maxwell mentioned, this presentation will be available uh, to download online um, as well as the toolkit itself. Um, so please feel free to use this presentation when you are doing your own trainings um, or workshops with this toolkit. Um, now it is my pleasure to invite uh, Mlewa and Esmas Kalama uh, to speak a little bit about uh, the landscape of universal health coverage in Eastern Southern Africa. Um, before I give the bio, I just want to ask Mlewa, are you on the call? Um, we were having- Yes, Kathy, I am on the call. I've been enjoying the presentations all along. Perfect. Um, I'm just going to rename you so that we know you're here. Um, and it is uh, great to have you um, here representing uh, Ianaso and Ianaso's very wide network in Eastern Southern Africa. Mlewa is a trained public health specialist and currently the technical center support manager for Ianaso, supporting Anglophone Africa information sharing platform. He holds master's degrees in public health and population studies and research, MA, from the University of Nairobi. He is a member of the GFAN Africa, supporting efforts towards increasing resources to support the Global Fund vision of ending HIV, TB, and malaria. Mlewa is a part of UHC 2030 Civil Society Engagement Mechanism, advocating for universal health coverage for all. Besides being an HIV advocate, Mlewa works to strengthen health systems um, across the region. Mlewa, thank you so much for joining, and we're excited to hear from you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you so much for that really nice uh, introduction. May I share my screen, please? We see it. Yes. Okay, I'm sharing. Can I share it from my side, Kathy? Uh, yes, you're sharing. I can see your slide. Yes, I'm sharing already. So let me just uh, um, share this. Uh, I have um, quite uh, um, a few slides. Actually, I call them talking slides. Uh, it's really not a heavy presentation because uh, what probably I'm about to talk to you um, is something that uh, probably all of us already um, already know, but uh, I'm always happy to keep on, on, on speaking about uh, universal health coverage. And uh, not just only in Eastern and Southern Africa, but in Africa and, and, and globally at large, because uh, it's all about health. We, 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 can, we can do everything else. We, we, can, we can achieve all other heights, but if we have uh, sick populations, if we have people that are not healthy, then all is a mirage. So um, that, that's, that's basically how I look at it. And uh, 
This is just briefly about Yana, so I'm just not going to uh, get into this, but just to let you know, this is Yanaso, and if you look at the map of Africa, all the shaded areas, that's where Yanaso has actually active programming. The blue section is what we cover under the Global Fund Communication and Coordination Platform, while the red part is where we actually have active membership in the, in, in the region. So that's basically Yanaso, and you can always reach us at www.enso.org and get extremely more useful information. So UHC, what it means. And, and thank you, Maxwell, you've really done already an extremely good job. I do not have to repeat this, but to just put it to the layman, I mean, I always like saying when every person, wherever they are, they should actually be able to access and afford quality health services. If we can be able to achieve this, we are actually on the right road towards actually um, the UHC. So how to realize that? Unfortunately, what many uh, don't talk about and we'll hear many theories, but uh, um, the truth of the matter is all about the money. And which monies are we talking about? There has been quite a lot of money flying across. Yes, we have heard about overseas development assistance. We've had several donor fundings from different sources. But if we're really going to scale up and we're really going to sustain universal health coverage, it all brings down to domestic funding for health to match the global and regional commitments. We always make commitments. All the time when our leaders go into forums, they always make commitments that this is what we are going to do. Commitments come with commitments come with actually uh, uh, needs to be actually actionable because after you've done a commitment, then you really need to follow that commitment with the actual action. And it's really actually putting money on the table to ensure that these commitments are actually realized. Now, I just want to give a very quick uh, brief of the very uh, usual suspects. Key commitments that have actually been made globally, regionally. And our leaders have actually assented to these com uh, commitments. And, and they, we are always saying, this is basically what we need, uh, we need We need actually want to do. I mean, globally, we all know that uh, for us to actually move towards achieving universal health coverage, we need actually to spend about 86.3 US dollars per capita. I mean, this, 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 this is globally known. I mean, we have ha all heard about their Abuja declaration. We are almost getting, getting actual news yet and hearing about this, but yes, it is 5% of the GDP to health. And we always keep on talking about this. There have been so many efforts to try to track this and try to see how it is actually performed because this is what is actually going to ensure there is increased resources for health at the country level to ensure to tackle the myriad of universal health coverage requirements. Talk about the EU commitments of 15% government spending in Africa. That actually you really want to spend 15% of government spending so that you can actually improve the health status of people. So allow me to talk briefly about this. And why I'm talking about this is because if we are going to realize UHC, time has come to talk less and put the money on the table and let the money speak. Now, let's look at per capita spending. We are talking about Eastern and Southern Africa, but of course, I just gave a broader picture of what, what's actually happening uh, in, in, the, in the entire African region. And now, if you look at per capita spending, we are actually talking about only about 10 of the 55 African Union member states spending at least 86.3 US dollars per capita on health. I mean, this is, this is like a drop, a drop in the ocean. And if you look at uh, the Eastern and Southern Africa, Actually, this year has only been realized in the Southern African part where we are talking about Namibia, we are talking about uh, Swatini, we are talking about South Africa, which have actually managed to raise that up to our, around 86.3 US dollars per capita. And of course, the Indian Ocean Islands of Mauritius and Seychelles have actually really been able to do that. But basically, the picture is, is, is actually really under par, so to speak. If we are using this as a base, as a target to say that we really want to improve and increase resources that are going towards health, then we are really not doing very well in this particular area. Let's look at our famous 5% Abuja declaration. It's even getting worse. If you look at this, I mean, it, it's, it's just, 
it's just it's it's, it's Namibia, Eswatini, uh, uh, Lesotho that have actually managed to push to five percent of the GDP that's actually being uh, allocated to health. But all the other countries, we are still not we are still not there. That that means we are actually really shifting the priorities, and we are probably not considering health that much of a priority, or we have our own best reasons. And these are really areas. These are commitments that our leaders met. If these commitments, if these targets were too high, someone should have come up and said, probably these targets are too high. Let's put them low. By the time we're actually agreeing to such targets, that means you have looked internally and we've said, yes, we can be able to do this. Why are we not doing it now? Very critical areas for us to step up the advocacy efforts to ensure that countries that committed to this actually really put money on the table to ensure that we raise the 5% GDP to, to 12 so that we can realize the goals of universal health coverage. Let's look at percentage of government spending, for instance. I mean, we are talking about only two countries have actually really gone there. So, well, people have, have talked about um, the GDP and it's like, oh, probably GDP is, is probably this too huge, but let's get down to government spending. That means the actual money we are actually having our government, government spend they are really we we are having we are having quite 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 less actually really going uh, into health and actually realizing the fifteen percent uh, government spending going to health has become extremely an uphill task in most of the countries apart from Eswatini and of course the bigger Madagascar there we can actually be able to see that that that's that's actually playing quite uh, and those are the only countries that have really be able to step step up this. Why am I presenting this? When we are able to see a country like Eswatini really getting to the 15% government spend at health, that means it's not something that is un, it's an unachievable. It's something that's achievable. What is it that is happening in Eswatini that they are really able to push it to 15% and we really cannot happen, have that happening in Rwanda or Burundi, which are equally smaller countries anyway. So if, if you look at that kind of comparison, what is it that we're doing? That means we are not short of good uh, examples in the region. Yes, there are countries. We have examples that have actually been managed to do it. Why can't we benchmark from there? Why can't we learn from there? And so what is it that we have done? Is it that probably the civil society out there are so uh, pushy, uh, holding their leaders to account? Or is it that the government systems, health systems are quite okay? What is it that they're doing? So I think this is an opportunity for us to say, yes, it is not undoable. It's, it's able, we can be able to do it. And how can we learn from this? And how can we step, step, step this forward? So just uh, 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 to take cognizance of, of time, challenges in realizing the USC dream. Of course, we know there has been quite a number of challenges. Probably that's why we are really seeing a lot of huge gaps. Yes, we know some lower middle income countries really do not have resources. I mean, that, that's there. And probably even if they really did put quite all that they, they had into health, it, it still may be a high, a, a difficult fit to, to, to achieve uh, universal health coverage in the countries. And probably what we are saying in such countries, that is why in as much as we keep on talking about domestic resource mobilization, we really do not want to write off overseas development assistance because we know their countries using their own domestic resources may actually not really be able to push up and get to the level that we can say that we are moving towards universal health coverage. So this is a clear area that we, we, we actually need to continue advocating for a continuation of ODA, even as we are pushing for increased domestic resource for health. Of course, issues of equity, and, and Maxwell has really talked this um, quite, uh, quite well, equity spending of resources, leaving some population groups poor, uh, uh, with poor access. This is a major issue, even in countries that probably could sustain a relatively good or huge budget for UHC you find that the equitable distribution of these resources to the different groups still leave some groups outside. The moment we can leave any group outside, that means we'll never re realize the dream of UHC. So that means we need to adopt an inclusive approach. Leave no one behind. Let's pull everyone together so that the resources that we have are actually equitably distributed. And of course, global benchmarks, uh, the cost of UHC may not adequately reflect subsequent funding challenges, associated with particular population health needs. And I, I think this is where we are talking about, and I talked about this, yes, we are putting targets, but even if we realize probably 5% GDP, will that be sufficient to actually guarantee universal health coverage? If we realize 15% uh, government expenditure, will that be sufficient 
to, 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 to realize universal health coverage? Or where shall we be? So I think there is really need to interrogate the global targets and regional targets that we are setting up so that even as we are marching towards a particular target, we are actually really monitoring and saying, even if we realize this target, will it actually take us where we really want, uh, where we really want to go? So areas for advocacy, as I conclude my presentation, let's think better spending and effective uh, 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 <clears throat> uh, monetary uh, protection. Let's talk about people-centered service quality and multi-sectoral uh, action. Let's talk about um, targeting the poor and marginalized, equitable access, leaving no one behind. And let's talk strengthening health uh, security and let's talk strong political and institutional foundations for the UHC agenda. These are areas we can actually really target to advocate. I mean, we need to target, uh, talk about better spending. There's so much leakage that happens. You find that even the little money that you have, we still don't use it uh, efficiently or effectively. There's still so much leakage. I mean, we, we always talk on behalf of people. We really don't want to bring people on the table to say these are really the UHC needs that we really need to be addressed. And at the end of the day, most of the time we miss the mark, even where resources are available. Targeting the poor. Most of the time, we talk about marginalized population, forgotten population, hard to reach population. In this era and age, we shouldn't be talking about hard to reach populations. We should be able to reach everyone. That's why the definition of UHC is talking about every person, wherever they are, they should actually be able to access good health. And we shouldn't actually use the excuse of, of, of actually hard to reach. Strengthening health security and stronger political institutions. Thank you very much, Kathy, for allowing me to. I uh, made this uh, quick presentation that actually shows uh, the, the, the space of UHC that uh, we, the situation of UHC that we, we have in Eastern, Eastern and Southern Africa. And just to use the major commitments as benchmarks that we committed to raise this amount of money or to actually reach this particular target, and we are still too far below, that means we still have a long way to scale the mountain of UHC. Of course, this is not without recognizing some good efforts that are actually happening in the region. We know countries like Rwanda have been doing very, very marvelous in their, in their, in their national um, uh, insurance uh, the schemes where almost every woman now gives birth in a health facility. Very good uh, progressive uh, um, uh, examples that we should actually always applaud. Uh, countries like Kenya that are piloting the UH, UHC package. I mean, let's, let's appreciate the progress that's happening, but of course, the challenge is still huge, the challenge is still wide, and we have a lot of advocacy space that we really need to engage. Thank you so much, Cathy. Thank you so much, Mayra, for that very insightful presentation about the status of UHC in the region. Um, you're absolutely right. We have some really great examples. And one, one key thing that we need to do is look at those countries that have made strides and see what has worked, why has it worked, and can we replicate it elsewhere? Um, so we do have some time for Q&A to both our speakers so far, to Mlewa, to Maxwell, and to what they presented. So if you have a question, um, please feel free to raise your hand, unmute, or add to the chat box. Um, we also have a few comments in the chat box. Um, actually, if I could call on NK to start our conversation. NK, you uh, made, some, made a really good comment in the chat box. Would you mind? Uh, coming to unmuting your mic and uh, coming to the group. Hey, Kathy, uh, this is NK. It's been a wonderful, very insightful session so far. Thanks to Maxwell and Mel, Wan, Mel Lewa. Very, very insightful. And I just have a question. I, and that question, I put it in the chat box. And uh, it's actually for, for both the presenters. And what I'm asking is that as critical as robust policies are to the health outcome of the population. Um, we know that government has made all kinds of declarations. How are we as advocates holding them accountable to those, uh, to those commitments? Maxwell or Lewa could answer, please. Okay, so, so Kathy, if I may just jump in, you know, okay, so this, what you said is very, very true. Uh, and I think one of the reasons why the toolkit focuses on empowering civil society organizations to move beyond 
good plans and designs and begin to focus on implementation and, and monitoring and comparing with commitments that has been made by our government and how you can do that in a more structured way. For example, you know, so in the Ghana government just issued a budget statement for 2022 last week. Uh, if you are a civil society organization in Ghana, how do you go about analyzing Ghana's health budget for 2022? What tools can you use? Um, and how do you go about structuring an advocacy around what you find uh, in, the, in the budget? So I think that's one of the empowering resources that you'll find in the, in the toolkit where you, know, you move beyond design and look at how we can really follow up with commitments and monitor implementation wow. and really hold our governments uh, accountable for the commitments they make on, on global and national platforms. So I think that's, that's, that's one of the reasons why this toolkit is, is very key for us to really use to um, empower and energize our advocacy plans. Thank you so much, Maxwell, for a very great answer. Can I call on Stephen? Uh, your, I see your hand is raised, Stephen and Gouache Kohli. Yeah, thank you very much, Kate, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Hi, Mulewa. Um, my name is uh, Stephen Anguva Shikoli. I'm the National Coordinator Network of TB Champions in Kenya. Uh, I have uh, one comment or a question. Um, I'm asking, uh, UHC came from somewhere. There was a source, and uh, in that source uh, is where the, the, uh, the, the leaders and presidents or heads of state signed on. And I think it was very clear, and it was saying that we need to do pilots up to this point. So my question is, do we have a document that is guiding pilots? Because uh, in some countries, like, uh, let me give an example in Kenya, we've seen pilots for almost uh, more than three to four years. So is, it a, is there a limitation of pilots? Because we might be waiting, and uh, yet uh, we wait for more than five years uh, that the country is still doing pilots. We need to see scale up of these interventions. And if you achieve the solution to everything and to access to healthcare, then I think all countries need to come in strongly and do a scale up, not only pilots. Thank you. <laughs> well, well, Kathy, I think it's a, it's a very good comment. Miloa, please go ahead. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and it's always refreshing to hear Stephen's voice speaking. I, I think uh, what 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 probably you are saying, Steve, is uh, is uh, is why we are actually having such uh, meetings today. Uh, that uh, what is it that we really we really can do? I mean, I mean, and, and when it comes to the issue of pilots, even pilots are commitments. Remember, by the time a government commits to pilot something, then that means they are saying that we really want to pilot this with a view to scale it up. So what are we doing when we see our governments actually pilot? Do we sit back and look at one pilot come after another, or do we actually step up and say, yes, this pilot had an end to scale up? Why is it actually really not being scaled up? I think that that's our value as, as advocates, to ensure that we hold our leaders to account for commitments that they make. Because I, I really don't think governments just will do a pilot for the sake of a pilot. It's a promise that we really want to pilot and then we want to scale up. So we shouldn't actually let them off the hook and say, we are piloting today and then we pilot tomorrow. But thank you, Steve, for that. I think it's an awakening call for us. And we have seen so many pilots in our countries. It's time to say that these pilots should actually scale up. Thank you. So if I may just jump in on this. So the, the, yes, the global compact that you know, countries have signed um, on UAC commitments details out how every country must have a UAC roadmap, you know, and, and as I said, your, your question is very relevant. If, if a country does not have a very comprehensive roadmap and how they are going to realize UAC, uh, then you have, you know, pilots or small scale approaches that do not have a very tangential bearing on how UHC is realized. So I think the first key step is for every country to have a well-designed UHC roadmap. And that's why it's key that civil society, we are embedded right at the beginning of the 
design of these UAC roadmaps. Uh, because once you have a roadmap clearly defined with you know, milestones and go or no go, um, um, marks and, and how learnings and insights will refine which model to use. And then you can avoid this scenario where you have fragmented uh, pilots, as just as you said, which uh, do not really um, you know, move this health system, system forward. So, so I think it's key that we are involved at the very design stage of the USC roadmap for every country. Uh, and we have very clear implementation uh, guidelines and we have very clear milestones that we can hold ourselves to with timelines. Um, and, and those commitments has been made transparent. We should involve people beyond health. I think one of the areas that we really need to work on is you know, involving stakeholders beyond health focused stakeholders. You know, so getting the broad uh, buy-in from ministries of finance you know, and all the other cost sectors that we were spoken about so that there's a collective ownership of the roadmap um, and, and making sure that you don't have these fragmented interventions. Thanks, Maxwell. And I think you hit a very relevant point. One thing that makes UHC advocacy perhaps a little different from other um, health issue advocacy is that cross culture uh, sectoral uh, role that uh, UHC needs. Uh, it's not only the Ministry of Health, but uh, the Ministry of uh, Finance, Education, Social Welfare, uh, Gender Rights. Um, the list is very long. Um, I just want to take a quest quick question from the chat box about the baseline information. Uh, do we already have baseline information on how far different countries have moved in terms of achieving different targets. Um, I just wanted to say that we do have a few resources, although you know data availability and the quality of data continues to be an issue. Uh, the latest global monitoring report on UHC from the WHO will be released uh, in December uh, around UHC day on December 12th. Uh, we also have UHC 2030's own State of the UHC Commitment Report, which is a multi-stakeholder review, uh, not just government data, but also looking at civil society consultations that we did at CSAM, uh, surveys that were sent out to civil society and to uh, other non-state actors, uh, media monitoring, and a variety of other data sources. Um, and the State of the UHC Commitment Report specifically looks at indicators uh, from the uh, key asks of the UHC movement. Um, so that's something that is also in the toolkit, like what these key asks are and how they came about and how we can use them to hold governments accountable. Um, so you can find that on UHC2030.org. Uh, last year's report and data portal for each country is currently active. Um, it will be updated um, around December 12th this year um, for the 44 countries who submitted voluntary national reviews uh, this year. So all this to say there are resources you know, from WHO for, and from other UN research, uh, resources, but um, data quality is something that you know, civil society has a role to play in um, and something that we have to continue to uh, be mindful of. Um, I see one more hand, uh, Eric. And this, uh, because of time, this will be our last question. Um, so Eric, if you could unmute. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Eric Mcheka. Um, I'm from Malawi. Thank you, Onesmas, for, for, your, for your presentation. Yes, my question is regarding how do we work on this tightrope? Um, what I mean, a tightrope is that, yes, we are, we are advocating for universal health coverage. And in most countries where, uh, 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 I mean, we are advocating, you'll find that the fiscal space does not allow, you know, countries to, to you know, you know, is, is limited so much so that, you know, governments are finding it hard to ensure that, you know, in terms of access to treatment, uh, no one is being left behind. Now, some countries are proposing to introduce universal uh, uh, national insurances where we know that if some countries like in Malawi, if we are to introduce national insurance, certainly it is going to differentiate quite a number of, of our people, um, majority of whom are living below the poverty line. So how, how, how do we work on this type 
tightrope as the CSOs. On one hand, advocating that, yes, we must have UHC where nobody sh sh should be left behind. At the same time, where government is proposing a solution, and we tend also not to accept, you know, uh, uh, the propositions that are sometimes put on the table. How do we walk with this tightrope? I hope I've made myself clear. Thank you, Adova. Yeah, I, I think you've made yourself uh, pretty um, quite clear. And um, it's, it's not that because uh, um, I'm responding to this question, I am the expert in the room. I, I believe that's a question we could actually all have uh, addressed. But like uh, probably I started by um, when I was talking about uh, the challenges. And we know some of the countries we are talking about here are really um, resource stripped, so to speak. Uh, to a point that even if we are talking of uh, putting in a, 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 a increasing domestic um, resources for health, there will actually not be enough resources to actually cover the entire needs of, 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 of UHC. And that's why I, I say that as advocates, even as we are really pushing our governments to hold our governments to uh, uh, be accountable to the commitments they have made, we should also still advocate for um, uh, the bigger brothers, I mean, uh, over, overseas development is still critical and important in some of the countries that are actually um, cash strapped, so to speak, or where resources are quite, um, quite, uh, quite, quite low. So I think uh, it is, it's all about uh, adopting a dual approach or a multiple, uh, um, uh, 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 multi thronged approach where we are looking at uh, both holding uh, um, uh, our leaders accountable to the commitments they have done and pushing them to, uh, to, 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 to increase resources. But of course, looking at uh, the feasibility of what actually we are advocating for and looking at other, 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 other sources as well. If I mean, we need to, to, to continue advocating for increased uh, uh, ODA so that we can actually supplement where actual resources are scarce in our countries. Probably that's how I would, I would look at it, but uh, maybe in the, in the group, someone else has, has, a, has a better response to how we can address that, which is a really, a really challenge. I really understand, thanks. Fatima, if I may just share quickly, quickly on this. So Onismos, you're, you're right. And Eric, thanks for a very good question. Um, one of the paradigms that we're experiencing in the global landscape now, is how we position health as an investment case rather than a spending uh, cost center. Because traditionally we have seen health as a, as a cost center. Uh, so you know the Ministry of Health receives a budget, spends it, and nothing comes back to the Treasury, um, which is actually not the case. Um, and really, one of the competencies that you know, we really also need to build as civil society is how we can present health as an investment case. And whilst I was uh, talking about the focal yeah, point, yeah, also, please, SDG, come here. I did mention how the SDG3 yeah. has cross linkages with all the other SDGs. Uh, so I, I think there's a whole discussion around how, how we position health as, as an investment case. So Eric, you are right. Fiscal space in lower and middle income countries are constricted. But if our governments want to buy guns, they do buy guns. If our governments want to fight wars, they do find money to fight the wars. If there's a political agenda that is made number one on an electioneering campaign, they do find resources to get those things done. In spite of all the you know, perpetual fiscal constriction that we have. Uh, uh, with budgets. So it's really about, you know, prioritizing health as an investment case. And I think it's, it's a whole discussion that, that, that we can have, we can have around that. But now the paradigm now really is, you know, not presenting health as, as a spending cost center, uh, but more as an investment case that if you, if you invest in health, you have, you know, uh, investment outcomes in education, in productivity, in GDP, uh, in economic growth, um, in security, um, you know, and, and, and what we can now call health nutrition and population, really the human capital development of a country, um, region hinges, hinges my health. Now science tells us that, you know, childhood nutrition is a function of your adult IQ. So, so we really need to, you know, position health as, as an investment case. Um, but let's keep in mind that when our governments want 
find money to do something, they really find the money. Yeah, and if there's anything that this pandemic has shown us, it's how fundamental health is to all the other sectors, whether it's education or infrastructure. Um, you, you know, you need workers, you need planners, and um, one one way to reduce that fragmentation is to have more diverse groups of civil society engage in advocacy for universal health coverage. That's one of the reasons we are um, doing this workshop and in many more events like this, so that um, civil society and groups who don't traditionally who may not uh, engage in healthcare have a way to enter the space and hopefully together we can reduce that fragmentation um, and make sure governments are prioritizing um, health because as Maxwell just said even where there are resources um, it's not it's, it's a prioritization issue it's a political will issue um, and where there aren't resources it's a way of mo mobilizing more. Um, so with that, uh, lots of great discussion happening in the chat box as well, just to note, we are, you know, taking a look at that, noting that, and we hope to come back to that. Um, but just conscious of time, uh, let's move into our breakout rooms. Um, so in the next session, we will be taking a deep dive into one specific tool that's presented in uh, the toolkit, in the Health for All Advocacy Toolkit. Now, this tool uh, might be familiar to many of you who work in different issues, but uh, we hope that in this breakout room, you'll be able to discuss it in the context of universal health coverage and use it as like one way to start discussing this with a smaller group of participants. Um, it's hard to get everyone to participate in this group of uh, 100 people on this call. So we'll be moving into three rooms. Um, the first one will be facilitated by myself and Deborah from Ianasso. The second will be facilitated by Nana Gleason from Bonella and uh, Yvonne from Ianasso, whom you've heard from. The third will be facilitated by Sandra Morania from White Ribbon Alliance Kenya and Sam McCall from Waki Health. Um, so I'm going to put everyone into the room now. Uh, please let me know if you have any issues through the chat box. Uh, we will be back in this main room in 30 minutes. We're starting to come back. Apologies for the delay. We Not were very into the discussion. <laughs> and yeah. It was difficult to end. I know. We were so engrossed and engaged. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I think the 30 minutes wasn't wasn't enough. It wasn't, wasn't enough, me up, maybe. Yeah, yeah. 30 minutes ended up like felt like this. Uh, you know, I, I remember when we were planning this meeting and we were like, oh, is 30 mm -hmm. minutes too long? But yeah. no, it uh, wasn't. <laughs> But it was very engaging. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome back, everyone. Um, so just, you know, a quick question. Uh, you know, we are almost, uh, we're very over time. So just very quickly, if one person can share, what was most interesting about the breakout room, uh, about the discussion in the breakout room? What's the comments that you heard that's going to stick with you when you leave today? Let me may go. I think the most uh, interesting discussion I had is the is that the government, when they there's a need for them to prioritize resources, even in the most limiting of settings, they're able to prioritize. For example, if there was that emergency on health, or there was that emergency to finance something on war for the the soldiers, some money will just come out of somewhere immediately. So the discussion in my group was like, could we make this a priority, this investment for UHC a priority and, and, and find a way of telling the government or working with the government to ensure that really they want to fund this, like an emergency because they can find resources from somewhere, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Sylvia. Um, really good point. We see this across countries. UHC is a political will issue. Um, governments are able to find funding for what they consider to be a political priority. Um, Mara, I see your hand is up. Would you like to come in? 
Yes, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, I was in, um, I think, breakaway room two. So what I'm taking away from the discussion is that um, I think we all agree that there are so many stakeholders that we can engage with. What I've noted is that um, we are aware of these um, different groupings, but we are simply not engaging them, maybe for one reason or for another. And I feel that we are losing an opportunity because we brush shoulders with these people um, all the time. Something else that has come up is that I think we really need to scrutinize our audience if we want to go and do advocacy and find those are, are those that are going to be symp sympathetic with our course so that at least they can catch one um, quickly and also run with the button speak, so to speak. And another thing is that um, I've been um, seeing or hearing or looking at documents of the um, universal health coverage. But um, from today's discussions, I think I've been more fired up because I've, I've got a bit of understanding of what um, we are supposed to do. I think for Malawi, um, the message is not widely spread. We hear it, but we don't really, I didn't really understand um, what role I could play until today. And I didn't even know that um, some of the things I've been doing are already within um, encompassed within the um, UHC. So, yeah, I'm very pleased that I joined this meeting and uh, I've really taken something out of it. Thank you very much for having me over. Thank you so much. That is great to hear. Um, and really, really good point uh, about, you know, the way that we do advocacy. Um, my One of my favorite quotes is what Maxwell presented from Margaret Mead about people coming together. And um, someone, I don't remember who was, a political strategist added the word organized to there. It's not just about a group of people coming together, but it's about a group of people coming together in an organized manner to make a difference. Um, and that requires some reflection that requires going back to these kind of basic tools where we map, where we analyze. Um, Sandra, why don't you come in and give um, what will be our last comment before the next session? Sorry to cut everyone off. Yeah. All right. Hi, Kathy. Hi, everyone. Um, so our group, we really had an interesting conversation. And, and it's what, one thing that stood out is uh, during advocacy, we tend to look for the usual suspects. Um, so like there are two people who are mentioned. Uh, our, our decision maker was the Minister of Health. And when we're doing the, the influence influencer mapping, we had one person talk about their PA or those that are, you know, the executive assistant that we never really think about. We'll go for technical questions or we'll go for um, key people in the health ministry. Uh, but then also the second person that, uh, that was mentioned was, you know, think about the, 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 the decision makers uh, background in this, in, this, in this case, religion. And so how do we then tap into um, such spaces? Uh, knowing the, the decision makers' background and beliefs, and and then how do we then look at look at that as an advocacy opportunity to then um, push some of our ads? Thank you. Thanks, Sandra. Uh, really, really good points. Um, I'm very conscious that we only have 15 minutes left. So I'm going to do the UHC day presentation first. And then if we have time, come back to some of these comments uh, to those who have their hands raised. Uh, really sorry to cut you off. You know, we always need more time. Um, so UHC Day, the reason that we wanted to tie this in uh, to this workshop today is that really, sorry, please mute your microphones. Um, uh, this is really the next opportunity for advocates from all kinds of spaces to really rally and come together and raise their voice and have everyone's attention be on universal health coverage. So the next UHC day is on December 12th, so we are less than a month away. And um, this is an annual observance. Um, and as I mentioned, it's a, it's a place for governments to come together, for uh, civil society, for academics, for the private sector, for others who might not have UHC day events, UHC events going throughout the year, but can really focus on this one issue and create a momentum. Um, and I think this year really build on the momentum that was already created uh, through these last few months uh, with all the work with uh, the G7, the G20, uh, post-COVID. Um, so uh, the uhcday.org, this website is the campaign website, and it has a list of events um, as well as digital resources. So, you know, the good and the bad with COVID is that 
annually every year there, there were there would be tons of rallies uh, many of you have participated in in-person events around uhc day um but because of the current situation a lot of events will be online but the pro with that is that that means that we can join um events that are happening all around the world so do visit the website um there is an event map where you are you can add your events and also see events from others the digital resources the toolkit includes graphics like this one um, as well as very easy to tweet social media messages that um, are separated by category um, there are facebook uh, profile frames uh, filters uh, whatsapp messages really a whole host of ways in which you can show your support for uhc online um, so please do visit our website for more resources on December 12th itself, uh, there will be a virtual rally and how that will work is that for 24 hour, hours, everyone who uses this hashtag uh, UHC Day will be featured on a live digital gallery on this website on UHCDay.org, um, as well as on the social media handles. Um, this is the CSEM social media handle, this is UHC Day official, and this is UHC 2030. So, um, Join us for that 24 hours. December 12th is a Sunday, but uh, throughout the week, uh, we will be having these messages shared um, and there will be specific prompts in these three categories, ask, amplify, and act um, around oh. UHC Day. So there are many ways of participating and uh, we would love to hear the events that you're already planning. Um, please do feel free to share this with this group um, in, in as a follow up to this workshop so that we can all join. Um, but in terms of the digital campaign, we have three ideas. Uh, these are ideas you can definitely do more or do less, um, but three ideas on ways you can get involved in the dig digital campaign this year. The first is a quote. Um, so just to let you know, I have uh, shared a PowerPoint presentation in the chat box, as well as uh, over email to everyone who registered for this meeting. It will be shared after the meeting as well. Um, so that PowerPoint is a set of templates you can use to create your own quote card. So answer this question, what does health for all mean? Or why should everyone have access to care without facing financial hardship. Think about your context in your country. What message do you want to tell your leaders right now in today's context? So one to two sentences, uh, optionally a photo, that will be a quote card. Uh, the second option is to take a video, uh, no fancy technology involved, uh, your phone, 60 seconds or less, a video about what does health for all mean to you? A couple sentences um, that can be shared on social media. And lastly, personal impact stories are very, very useful for all kinds of advocacy. Have you been impacted by the lack of access to healthcare services? If so, share your story in 250 words or less. Um, or, you know, on the flip side, have you been positively impacted by a health program or, or a, a plan that was specifically put into place uh, to protect this particular community? Um, how does you how has UAC impacted you? Um, so feel free to share your story. Uh, you can either send it to us directly um, at CSEM at msh.org or you can post it to your social media channels and uh, please do tag, please do tag UHC day, um, hashtag UHC day, uh, so that it can be in the, in the digital gallery. So um, just to show you what is on the PowerPoint that was shared, um, a few, some more details about how to make the template, uh, a few sample questions, and then uh, suggestions on um, sharing this on social media. Like, so this is the slide. If you save the slide as an image, that can be something that you can post on social media. So there are instructions here. Um, and if you, not, if you need support or would like to share this with others and need more instructions, feel free to email us and and uh, we will support. So this is an example of a quote card where you can add your photo um, as well as your quote, your name, your organization, your country. Um, another card without a photo, another option without a photo. Um, more details on the selfie video. Um, and I just wanted to note that if you, you know, one more inspiration on how, what to say or how it should look, um, do look at the digital toolkit. It is uh, linked here. Uh, it's on uhcday.org and it has a lot of um, resources, including the Zoom backgrounds that many of you are already using. Um, and lastly, the blog, um, which is a short story. So uh, these uh, specific directions are on the, on the PowerPoint slide. 
Um, and just to give a quick example of a, so what a social media post can look like, this was adapted. This is a tweet that was adapted from the digital toolkit. Um, and this is a quote card uh, that was made for the Asia focused workshop, but very much the same idea um, attached to the tweet um, tagging your HC day. So that's an example of how, how you can get involved in the digital campaign for UHC Day. If you have in-person events, if you're doing your own events in, with your organizations and networks, please let us know. Please add it to the map. Um, if you go to this website, there is a, a tab that says share your plans. Um, and that is a great way to create more visibility for your event and uh, show the strength of the UHC movement globally. Uh, so the more people people we can get involved, the better it is, whether it's your family, whether it's your friends, whether it's the Facebook classmate from years ago, uh, they're all welcome to join the UHC movement. Uh, with that, I just wanted to say thank you uh, to everyone. And uh, you can download the toolkit at cscmonline.net. And if you want to stay updated on upcoming activities with the toolkit, if you want to be engaged in discussion forums online, do join the CSCM um, on, on the website. There is a very short uh, registration form. Anyone can join the CSCM as long as you are a civil society or a community organization. Um, and you do not have to identify as a UHC advocate to join. Um, I also wanted to very quickly uh, thank a number of people without whom uh, we would not be able to have this event. So if you could indulge me for a minute. Um, I, I wanna thank Yanaso, our lead partner here, and uh, Yvonne Okahimbera, uh, Mlewa Onesis Kalama, and Deborah Yaseya from Yanaso. Uh, thank you to Maxwell Antti from Pharmacist, uh, Farm Access Group and the CSEM Advisory Group for uh, presenting the toolkit on our behalf. Um, to White Ribbon Alliance Kenya and to Sandra Marania for all the work on co-organizing this, uh, this workshop with us. Uh, we had a really great group of partners, including Bonella, uh, Nana Gleason, uh, Smile Train and the CSEM Advisory Group, uh, NKOV, from Success Capital and also the CSEM Advisory Group, Duvi Gacha, from Hennet, Dr. Mercy Onsando, from Waki Health, Sam McCall, from the South African NCD Alliance, we had Dr. Vicky Pinkney Atkinson, and from Canco, Sylvia Ion. Thank you uh, to this great group uh, without whom this workshop could not have been done, um, as well as to my colleagues at the CSEM Secretariat at UHC 2030. Um, and to all of you for joining us for two and a half hours on a very busy day. Um, thank you so much. And I want to pass it to Yvonne for any final comments, um, as well as if there's time for other questions or comments. Thank you so much, Kathy. I think I'm going to be very brief because of time. Just want to also thank everyone who has participated. It's been a very informative uh, workshop. I believe we have learned a lot. And I urge every one of us to join the, the movement for advocating um, UHC uh, in our respective countries. So let's keep the momentum, let's keep engaging. But uh, one request that maybe came out of the uh, of our discussion is um, there's that urge of continuous capacity building with civil society to understand better the toolkit and see how they can amplify the advocacy efforts uh, within their region. So that is um, that was a request, and I know we'll continue having a series of uh, workshops on the advocacy. Uh, uh, efforts towards the UHC, that is something that I wanted to, to highlight. But again, to also urge all of us here to continue amplifying advocacy efforts on domestic resource mobilization, uh, strength, uh, strengthening our health system. So it's been a very good um, uh, session and we really appreciate your commitment and time up to this hour. And uh, we keep in touch, let's keep in touch, especially um, uh, on the digital campaign on the UHC day. Let's keep in touch and let's all participate and be able to uh, make a change leaving no one behind. So thank you all, all of you to our facilitators, to you, Kathy, Asante Sana, that is Swahili. Thank you so much and uh, enjoy the rest of the evening, the rest of the day, wherever you are. Thank you, everyone. Asante Sana. Bye. Cheers. <laughs> bye bye. bye. bye.